I have entitled the presentation context sensitive design towards environmental, social and economic sustainability. And as I mentioned, the goal is to show uh, how design computing can help in achieving a more sustainable uh, built uh, environment. Okay, so the about the SCDC emission and goals. So the goal, the mission is to support integration of digital technologies in design and construction. But the focus is not on technology, but on strategically deploying technology to address contemporary societal issues. So uh, we have our goal to contribute for the achievement of United Nations development goals. So we align our mission with United Nations sustainable uh, development goals. Um, I always like to show this graph on my presentations. It shows the growth of the human population and, you know, as you can see in the graph, what it's telling us is that over the next 20 years, we have to build as many houses as we have built in the past 2000 years. So how can we solve a problem of this scale? So this slide shows different uh, answers to the problem. As you can see on the top left corner, it's uh, an informal settlement when people cannot afford to buy a house on the market and build a house themselves. So it has many problems. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, it's the usual governmental approach, the use of repetition uh, in a very large extent, which also causes some problems. And what we have in mind is uh, this idea of uh, getting environments that are, have, have a nice balance between being diverse and or orderly at the same time, that have uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, have um, so that have infrastructure and um, Sorry, I was distracted by a call for by one of uh, my speakers. Uh, a nice balance between order and diversity. So we, what we want to do is to find ways to develop, um, you know, uh, new environments that have some of the qualities that we value in these historical uh, settlements. So just to highlight a little bit what, uh, you know, what the solution might be, I like also to show this slide. So it's uh, the DNA code. And, uh, you know, it's the code of life. And the, the idea is that if we change the code, uh, in some ways, we end up with uh, diverse living creatures, but this does not happen randomly. So it happens in a way that they are the fittest to the environment where they live. So that's the idea. You know, have you know a language that you can manipulate the code, the code of architecture, and then generate buildings that are tailored to their context. That's why you know the meaning of the context-sensitive design. Uh, according to the United Nations. We have 900 million people living today in informal settlements, and the estimates that this number might double by the year 2025. So this is a fact. Um, you know, informal settlements, we see it not as a problem, but as a solution with many problems. So they don't have infrastructure most of the times. There are no green spaces. There are no public spaces and have a huge ecological impact. On the other hand, they are very sustainable. Otherwise, they would not exist. They are complex. They are usually centrally located. They are especially very rich and create a very stimulating environment. They are affordable and very colorful at, at the same time. So how can we uh, you know, achieve environments of, uh, with this quality? So the idea is that digital technology can provide the means for developing and applying uh, these uh, methods. And we have developed what we call the World Studio, which is uh, uh, you know, both a research project and a course that evolve in parallel. And the idea is to work as a platform to develop, test, and teach uh, new methods and technologies to tackle the problem of the informal uh, settlements. So how can we use uh, technology? So let me give you an example of a work that we did a few years ago uh, in the World Studio. So the diagram shows the different kind of digital technologies. And on the right hand side, you see how you could apply uh, them in the study of informal settlements. So we start with the, the existing building. In this case, it's not a building, it's a community. And we use digital scanning um, to cre create a digital model from reality. So it basically, you know, scan the environment and create a digital model. So the next step uh, is to, uh, you know, use the digital model to create a physical model using a digital fabrication. So the, digital, uh, the physical model is a little bit more tangible and it can be used to understand a little bit better things like the topography of these very steep uh, environments. Then, you know, from the digital model, we can also extract what we call a computational model, which is a rule-based model that can be encoded into a computer program 
that is able to generate new uh, environments with the features that we see in the informal settlements. So basically we extract the rules and reapply the rules. However, we don't apply the rules as they are. We can change the rules to make sure that we generate uh, new developments that do not have the flaws that we perceive in the formal settlements. And in other ways, you know, it's decode and recode the informal settlement. Then once you have this uh, rule-based model, you can actually use it to generate different candidate solutions. Uh, but we can also uh, use uh, the model together with um, you know, simulation and analysis tools to guide the generation of new solutions towards uh, solutions that have specific features. So in this slide, for instance, you see you know, uh, the uh, model that Gaudi used for the construction of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. So this was a physical model, but the idea was to simulate the behavior of the building. So now we have digital tools that can also simulate the behavior of buildings and the communities from different viewpoints, from the structural viewpoint, from the environmental viewpoint, and so on. So you can actually, uh, once we have the generative system that is able to generate different candidate solutions, we can use these simulation analysis tools to find the solutions that have you know, the right uh, qualities, the qualities that we are looking, uh, looking for. So this is called performance-driven uh, design. From the digital model, we can also create the virtual reality model. And the virtual reality model, what it can do is can provide the user with a sense of being immersed in the environment. So it might be an existing environment, uh, like we did for um, the favela, or it can actually be you know, the, the design. So it's used both to go site visiting and to convey design solutions to the user. So this is basically an overview of different technologies that we can use in, uh, in, in design. So uh, then what we want to be able to generate designs that match the context uh, that are sensitive to the constants, we need uh, three systems. We need a design system that it's able to take information about the context and generate a solution. Then you need a production system to materialize the solution. Both of these systems are controlled by a computer system using the high processing power of the computer to link features of the context, the features of the design, the features of the production system. So going a little bit deeper into the design system, we have basically four subsystems. The formulation system reads the context and generates design brief. The generative system takes the design brief and generates candidate solutions. The evaluation system uses simulation and analysis tools to rank, uh, to rate and rank the solutions. Then we use a uh, search system to do the optimization, that is to find the solution that you know, more closely fits the design uh, context. So this is you know, an example of uh, solutions like this. So you have a design system, you can create an interface that's user-friendly. Uh, and then so people that can use, for instance, to design uh, their own houses. And then, you know, you can generate many for different solutions. You can also do this uh, at the urban uh, design level by generating, uh, you know, um, urban solutions in the same way you generate the house. So it's, this works on different scales. At the end, you are able to generate customized houses in very diverse uh, urban environments. So this is what we have been doing in the World Studio. This is an example of the students' work last semester in Ahmedabad in India. So they create a rule-based model of their design that can be used to generate customized houses and a diverse urban environment. And they did so by extracting the rules to generate the new houses from the existing, uh, from the existing uh, houses. Then the production system is used to materialize the solutions. Um, you know, and then you can use it even at the material level by uh, customizing the design of building elements. Like in this case, you can design a wall for the performance by changing the porosity of the wall. You know, it's uh, denser when it needs to be stronger. It's lighter when it can be, uh, you know, uh, lighter because it doesn't have much load. Then you can use, uh, you know, a 3D printing system to create the building parts. So in this case, you see a building parts that has a higher percentage of cork 
on the outside to shield the wall from the uh, external conditions, from the weather um, and so on. Uh, this is what we have been doing uh, in the concrete printing studio. Uh, what we, we do, we basically teach students how to uh, develop uh, um, designs for 3D printing. Uh, so this is the work of one of the students who developed last week. So they basically understand or can actually customize uh, designs and in a way that they are printable. So the idea is to use this technology to print um, houses. Um, and they study different forms in different shapes just to enclose the building, both the walls and, and the roofing system. And this is the idea so that we are able to very quickly in an affordable way to generate uh, in a houses that match the physical and the cultural um, context. We apply this technology in an extreme case of context sensitive design. So we entered the NASA competition. We had to design buildings for Mars and for Earth. We use the same uh, you know, system. We're using gen the generation uh, capability of the computer, using simulation analysis to find optimal solutions and even you know, design the process of construction at the same time. So basically it's a, what we call a holistic design. We are just designing the product, but the process at, at, this, at the same time. Uh, so we end up with two different designs because we are talking about two totally different contexts. You know, Mars has a very slim atmosphere, a lower gravity than Earth. So the designs look different for Earth uh, and, and Mars. So this is the, you know, the printing of a solution um, for Earth. Uh, which enable us to actually uh, develop um, a design and build the largest structure completely in print, 3D printed and enclosed. Uh, I'm gonna show now the work of several of my PhD students. Um, you know, Elena could not be here today, so I'm gonna present the work uh, for her. And then we have other students as well. So Elena is a PhD student in the SCDC. She is concerned also with the context sensitive design uh, so this is the work of her uh, master thesis. So basically she's from Paraguay. Uh, you know, in Paraguay, it's very common to have these walls. So it's called perforated walls. So basically use bricks to come up with walls that can filter lights uh, and uh, protect, uh, you know, the house from the hot uh, tropical climate. So what she did, she basically studied different walls, extracted the rules from these walls, creating a parametric design system that implements the rules. You know, so now she has a generative system that can generate different configurations. Now she can use simulation and analysis tools uh, to check uh, you know, the performance of different solutions. And then they can choose optimization to find the optimal solution for the given context, for the geographic location, and for uh, you know, the, the place, the cultural context where it is inserted. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so this is what we call a static system, pardon me. <clears throat> <clears throat> because it's optimized at the time of construction. We can also do this dynamically. So the building has the ability to change its configuration in real time to re in response to the change of environmental conditions or use conditions and so on. So what Elaine is now doing for her PhD is she's working with smart materials to be able to design facades that are responsive, that can change the configuration in response to the change in environmental conditions. It might be light, it might be a temperature and so on. So she has been working with these materials. In this case, it was a, a, a material that was sensitive humidity, so it would change shape uh, you know, in the presence of humidity. So you could actually make the wall more porous <clears throat> when there was more humidity. So she's basically trying to understand how these materials work, model the behavior of the material so that she can create a computational model of the behavior. Then she can then use to design optimized uh, design. So you uh, I have the ability to generate the configurations, but then you can in real time by actuating the material, change the configuration of the facade. So you see different steps uh, in different possibilities. So you have you know, not just the physical properties, 
that the design features uh, that you can play with to create these small um, elements. <clears throat> and then you can use these elements to create facades that are responsive. Uh, you know, so for instance, you can open up the elements, make them change. So we are talking about shape changing materials when you need to increase the amount of light in the interior, for instance, and do the, the reverse, close them when the light is too strong. I will end over now to Julio. Um, so Julio is also a PG student uh, in the SCDC, but also affiliated with the Material Matters Cluster uh, in the Department of Architecture. So Julio, I will show the slides. I think you can speak now. Uh Okay, thank you so much, Jose, for, uh, for the opportunity to share my work. So my PhD research is about uh, exploring the reuse of a waste material, in this case is waste cardboard, uh, in low and middle income uh, context. Uh, so my work is based on the build, developing a workflow from uh, collection to the assembly of building components for housing, for low-cost housing and is addressed for uh, waste collectors uh, working in, in, in the streets that collect informally collect cardboard. Next slide, please. please. So there are several parts of the work. Uh, for example, in, 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 uh, I took as a case study in my home city, uh, Asuncion, Paraguay, where the rate of recycling is very low and most of the cardboard that is uh, used ends up in, in, in landfills or, or generally impacting negatively the, the environment. Uh, digital computational tools uh, are used here in combination with low tech tools to mediate between the material and the building system. So in this case, uh, computational design tools and methods are used for helping designers uh, to create the designs uh, so, the, so then waste collectors can follow the instructions and, and build the components. Uh, the work has been developed uh, both in at Penn State at the, uh, working at the shop uh, in a controlled environment, but I also organized a few workshops back in Paraguay where I work with uh, a group of waste collectors to test the system and see how these uh, instructions generated uh, through computational design tools uh, work. Next, please. So this is a, a slide that, that shows, for example, one of uh, an examples of a parametric system that is used for uh, generating templates. So you get the cardboard from the streets, uh, the cardboard that is not contaminated, that is not wet, that is in good conditions, but then you need to figure out how to make a, a shape with that cardboard that can be used for building something. So parametric system in this case, uh, help uh, the builder to get the, the, the templates for scoring and cutting those pieces of, 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 of cardboard. Next, please. So with those components, in this case, uh, one, one can create uh, these uh, triangular shaped tubes with, with, carb with sheets of uh, waste cardboard that can be used for uh, casting concrete, for making this uh, uh, concrete slabs that can be used for a flooring system. Next, please. Another use of a uh, parametric system for uh, dealing with cardboard is to design these molds that can also be used for casting concrete and creating these uh, screen, uh, screen walls. That's similar to what uh, Joseph showed before in the work of, of Elena. These screen uh, walls can be used for filtering sunlight and they can be built by, by parts and, and with uh, very little material. Next, please. But waste cardboard can also be used as a uh, insulation material. Uh, so the same uh, triangle tube that was designed with a parametric uh, system, in this case, I tested for, as a component for, for um, as an insulation material. Uh, the results are, but the results are, are decent. It, it is, cardboard is not as good as stone wool, for example, but still in a context where you don't have the resources for buying a, a conventional uh, insulation material, but you have access on the other hand to almost free uh, material from the, from the, way, from the waste stream, it's a, it's a big uh, game changer. Next. 
Another uh, computational uh, system that I use in this research is shape grammars. So shape grammars is a rules-based algorithmic system used to design or decode existing designs uh, by computing with shapes. In this case, shape grammars was used for designing these uh, cardboard panels made with the triangular tubes. Uh, so people can build wall panels with that and, 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 and use that as part of uh, an extension of the house or to build a new house and tackle the problem of, of uh, lack of decent housing. Next slide, please. Another image of, and this is again uh, using shape grammars to generate the floor plans of a, a wall panel uh, housing system. Uh, so using the same panels uh, with waste cardboard, uh, in this case, shape grammars is helpful for generating, uh, for taking that material, taking those components and generating uh, typical floor plans for, for the house that are contextualized. So this, this housing system is, is based on local uh, housing typologies. So overall, the, the work aims to contribute to first to divert uh, waste uh, from, from landfills to architecture and introduce uh, and combine these low and high technologies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julio. Uh, now I will uh, let Naveen explain his work. Uh, so good morning and uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my work. Uh, so straight away dive into my work. So I work in this area where I uh, come up with uh, computational methods to design buildings, uh, better buildings. So as buildings and building systems are getting complex, there are multiple systems in a building like HVAC system, MEP system, structural system, architectural system, and integrating all of these is a very complex uh, maneuver. So we, uh, when dealing with multiple systems, we also deal with multiple objectives. We want the building to be structurally efficient. We want it to be energy efficient. We want it to be constructible within a certain set of time. And then like we want it to be uh, constructable within a particular budget. So all these objectives have to be met. So how do we deal with all of these? So we need a paradigm shift in the way that we design buildings. So next slide, next slide please. So as I told, uh, since we are dealing with like a lot of different systems, like all these uh, structural, architectural and MEP systems, and if you could press uh, just the right arrow, Professor. So all of these systems together contribute a building. So it's like a one complex interplay of like multiple different systems. So how do we kind of like integrate these in the proper manner? And that changes from project to project. It's not one common way if for every different building, it's different. Next slide, please. And each of these systems is also designed by different uh, stakeholders like engineers, architects, and uh, energy analysts, and cost estimators, and uh, construction managers. So each one of them might have like a different objective. For example, the most structurally efficient building might look a particular way, whereas the most convenient floor plate shape, which kind of like gives us the most efficient, cost efficient way to route the MEP pipes and things might look a different way. Whereas like a most daylighting friendly option might look a different way. So there is a conflict. There are lots of trade-offs in designing uh, these buildings. We don't want four different options for designing one building, right? We want one design option which kind of like tackles all these four or five different problems or like how many ever depending on the design brief so how do we kind of like come up with like one particular building which solves all these problems so in such situations uh, where we have multiple options and multiple trade-offs the only efficient way to kind of like go about with designing is to generate as many design combinations as possible and then compare them for their different performances and then make informed decisions so uh, like Engineering fields have dealt with this as in specifically aerospace engineering and automobile engineering have uh, developed like numerous amount of multi-objective optimization algorithms, but it's something which has been in the infancy for uh, AEC industry, at least for the past uh, 10 to 15 years. There, there have been exploring uh, multi-objective optimization techniques in AEC field, but it's still in the infancy. Next slide, please. So the problems here is uh, current advancements in the AEC field, such as building information modeling is one thing where like all the stakeholders are allowed to collaborate on a single platform. They only support early stage design optimization. There are multiple systems as I told in a building like structural HVAC, and then like we have the architectural system. 
So each of these systems require heavy uh, modeling and analysis tools to be uh, used to evaluate these systems. For example, structural system, the most sophisticated modeling would be finite element modeling. And then like we are uh, given the current situation, like we have COVID-19 and then we would like to kind of like check the buildings for infiltration and then like we would want to know if there are particle transmissions uh, within the building, how is airflow within the building. So these are complex simulations. Uh, they require heavy computational time and then there are sophisticated modeling tools which kind of like uh, do this computation fluid dynamic modeling and then uh, we also have like energy and daylighting models which are heavily physics based that are early stage energy and daylighting uh, models but there are also like heavy uh, and sophisticated physics based uh, analyses for these so integrating all these things with the building information modeling is still not there yet uh, there have been advances in each of these tools in a separate manner there have been advances in building information modeling in a separate manner but there has been a lot of fragmentation and kind of like combining these two which is like the ultimate enabler for multi-objective and multidisciplinary optimization and one other thing is setting up the optimization framework for such complex problems is like heavy and tedious and it's still confined to researchers and academicians and like uh, practitioners find it difficult to kind of like set up this entire optimization framework next slide please so addressing these, uh, my PhD research revolved around developing like a BIM-based multidisciplinary optimization framework, which I would like to just highlight, uh, give a bird's eye view perspective of what involves the feature sets of it. So first, it is a cloud-based uh, tool, which means multiple stakeholders from different parts of the world and different parts of like the ID could kind of like collaborate on a project. And downstream, if a structural engineer makes a change, then the architect would also be allowed to kind of like get hold of the information and then like incorporate it in the optimization. And then second thing is it's interactive. So it kind of like uh, bars the front end as in the architect and then the structural engineer or the construction manager from it screens them from all the back end operation and then they just have to set the design goals they say i want a building which is between this energy uh, consumption level i want a building which has like this much amount of daylighting i want a building which has this much amount of cooling load so it's very interactive all that you see on the screen the sliders it's the same way that it is going to look for the architects or for the engineers or for anyone involved in the project. And then the third uh, important point being it uses a uh, specific technique uh, called machine learning is a broad term, but I use a specific term, a specific type of machine learning called surrogate modeling. So one problem with that is like, generating hundreds and thousands of options might seem easy when we uh, look at it verbally but like uh, actually it's very computationally expensive because like modeling all of those systems three-dimensionally is going to be very expensive and then analyzing them is another uh, uh, tedious task so where surrogate modeling or machine learning comes into play here is once you generate say 50 options it learns from those 50 options and then kind of like we don't have to generate the next set of 50 options instead it predicts this might be the potential solution the, obviously there might be areas of error or approximations but like i'm trying to kind of like reduce the error rate and then improve the accuracy of it so it also kind of like takes into account uh, uh these and this is a prototype of the framework that i developed so this is the front end that you will see where you can set like uh, what is is the energy consumption that you want? What is the heating load? What is the daylighting? And what uh, build cost that you want? And based on that, you can see towards the right side, there's a graph and then all the desi design options are represented there. So it would identify, the system would identify which design option fits all your criteria. Next slide, please. So uh, using the proposed framework, I tested it by using it to design an office building, a sample office building. So there are three major steps involved here one to generate a model like hundreds and thousands of different design options and two to analyze them for different performance factors say structural performance build cost and daylighting here are like sample uh, performance factors and then make an informed selection uh, next slide please and I also used the framework to, uh, I tested the framework by using it in the NASA competition for designing a 3D printed uh, habitat. One uh, important change here was that in addition to the usual performance factors like structural performance, build cost and daylighting, I also kind of like uh, checked it for uh, robotic construction time, which involves like robotic simulation of like how all these like different uh, options would be 
constructed and that helped us uh, identify the most efficient option which could be 3d printed on site during the finals of the competition so here we are also testing it for constructability which typically in construction field is not tested during the early stage design options. We don't think about like how the building is going to be constructed as a major deciding factor upfront during the early design stages, but like having such a framework helped us bring such later stage design decisions during the early stage, which means there is, it's going to eliminate the need for unnecessary revisions at later stages. And uh, that's uh, all that I have. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Vina, and actually the scale of my study is a bit different from my colleagues. I look at the city scale. So if you go to the next slide, uh, cities, so by definition, they're focal point of energy consumption and their forms have significant bearing on the balance of um, the, on the balance of building and transport energy use, which are the two main sectors that are directly affected by urban planning. So climatically responsive and energy con conscious design of cities is vital to improving the quality of life of urban dwellers and in any notion of sustainability. It enables communities and neighborhoods to make use of the natural energy to reduce people's um, dependency are on air conditioning their dwellings. They moderate city traffic and enhance pedestrian comfort and activity um, in outdoor spaces and, and much more. Next slide, please. What I'm doing for my PhD research is that I'm focusing on the environmental and the energy implications of, of buildings at an urban scale. So I'm not looking into traffic, I'm only looking at the urban scale, uh, the buildings at urban scale. The goal of my research is to enable the spatial design of neighborhoods in a way that they could harvest their own energy from the sun by maximizing the, their PV energy production while minimizing its energy consumption in daily activities. Next slide, please. For this, I had to find the relational pattern between the spatial structures of urban form and the net amount of energy that is being consumed at a neighborhood scale and the net amount of PV energy that is produced at neighborhood scale. So to find this relational pattern, which is a complex one because urban form is a complex entity, I had to benefit from machine learning algorithms and specifically artificial neural networks to discover how and to what extent these um, this different variables of urban form impact energy performance in communities. Next slide, please. For my studies, I used San Diego County as my case study, and I discovered uh, that those spatial features of urban form, which are related to the compactness, diversity, passivity, and shading of a community have the most impact on energy performance uh, at a neighborhood in San Diego. Then I used this statistical analysis and I architecturally interpreted them because I wanted to know, so what, you know, all these numbers and graphs, what does it mean for an architect, for an urban planner? How can an urban planner really use this to create and develop um, communities and, and, and neighborhoods in San Diego, which are energy self-sufficient? Therefore, I came up with a set of principles, design principles, that would guide the designer for spatially designing an energy self-sufficient neighborhood in San Diego. In addition to this guideline and framework, I also realized that it's not only that, you know, architects, urban planners might not know what are those principles that, you know, they could design a, a energy conscious neighborhood, but it's also the lack of tools that they have already in the market. So Naveen uh, already talked a bit about it. If you, if any of you has already worked with energy simulation tools, it takes tremendous amount of time to run simulation, energy simulation for one building, let alone if you wanna simulate an urban neighborhood, like a community, it takes a lot of time. And I have failed in that a lot. I was using these tools. So I realized that I need to provide architects, urban planners with a tool that, you know, they could, design and see in real time, um, they could see how the, their the energy performance of their designs. That's why I use the, the learned um, models, the learned predictive models from my trainings, which as Naveen also said, they're named as surrogate models. Uh, I use those surrogate models at the back end of a software prototype that I developed that uh, the, the architect urban planner could go and they could design their neighborhood. And in real time, they could see uh, the values of um, energy performance of that neighborhood that they have designed. Following these principles, the urban planning principles that I extracted for San Diego and the tools that I'm providing, 
An architect or urban planner could be uh, able to design energy independent, energy self-sufficient communities with their local power system, such as community microgrids. They would be able to spatially design those and enable them to produce the energy that they need in a, at an uh, affordable cost and remain functional during power outages, increasing their resilience at a time where the power outage have become more, uh, power outages are becoming more frequent in, in cities due to climate change. Yep, that's it. Thank you.